All right, hey guys, a short but important video today on how to train calculation. Of course, it should be no secret by now if you want to improve your chess, one of the most important pillars of trying to do so is going to be improving the very concrete side of your game, so tactics and calculation. And what I mainly want to cover were three common mistakes I see a lot of players who are sort of less experienced doing, and also conversely the three things that most players, including myself, who are a bit stronger and more experienced, do every time they practice some sort of calculation. And so the first mistake is just simply not using a real board, and look, this will depend a little bit on your goals, but if your goal is to eventually, like many people watching my channel do or are hoping to do in the future, is to play some sort of like over the board chess, you really want to make sure that, you know, practice you're doing is with a real board. Because many people, especially if you've come into chess more recently, you know you've started playing chess not on a real board, but actually like on a 2D screen. There's many people who sort of experience, there's a bit of a difference between, you know, visualizing stuff on the 2D board. For many people, if that's what you start off doing, it's easier than actually doing it on the real thing. So definitely, whenever possible, right, make sure you're actually practicing your sort of calculation or any study in general as much as possible on a real 3D board. And the second mistake is going to be not calculating everything from the initial position. And this mistake is very common these days because when you do stuff like puzzle rush or online tactics, these sort of mediums very much encourage you to not have to calculate everything from the starting position and just sort of play it move by move and figure things out along the way. However, this is really a big mistake, especially once again if you have some serious goals that you want to achieve over the board, just trying to sort of, you know, wiggle your way through some sort of calculation by just playing the moves out on the board move by move, that could be very disastrous because if you go into a line which is refuted by some, you know, detail deeper down the line, if you don't calculate all the way from the beginning and you just sort of, you know, like, oh, let's play this and see what happens, that's going to cost you a lot of points in the long run. And so again, the last point I just talked about, using the real board, this sort of ties in with this one because you're going to be a lot less tempted to do that sort of stuff if you're using the real board because it's like, you know, when you do it online, it's like the computer or whatever program you're using, it'll give you like a, you know, like a tick box, like, oh, good job, you found the first move, but it doesn't matter if you found the first move, that's not good enough to actually, you know, solve a, or find in a real game the, the correct idea. So the third and final mistake that I see a lot of players make and something that you really need to make sure you're doing within every calculation session is writing down the damn answers. And the reason I believe it is so incredibly important to do this is that it's important to be accountable for your solution. Especially, you know, if you're working through like puzzle books, right? Where it's like, you don't play the moves in some sort of like trainer. Like even if you do the last two steps I was just talking about, you use a real board, you calculate everything from the initial position. It's way too easy to sort of just flip over to the next page in the book, look at the solution, and then be like, oh, I, I think I sort of saw that when it's like, no, in reality, you, you didn't. You might have saw the first move, but did you see like the further details down the line that really enable you to play that move? And admittedly, I think this is something that definitely helped myself a lot. I started doing this around when I was maybe 15 or 16 years old. Before that, I was very sort of unstructured with this sort of calculation stuff. I was just sort of like winging it a lot of the time. But I think definitely once I got more serious about that, I really saw a big improvement in the clarity of my calculation, actually calculating real tournament games, where before that, you know, like kids, they're often, you know, reportedly supposed to be very sharp and stuff, but that wasn't really me, I struggled a lot with calculation even when I was a bit younger, a lot of the time things would be very like fuzzy in my head, I'm sort of like I'm not seeing things properly, but at least anecdotally I can kind of say that once I sort of you know, enforce this structure into my calculation training the voice, writing down the solutions and being accountable for my solution, that definitely improved my calculation a lot in more practical like over the board situations. But to wrap up the video, I want you guys to really try and put all these things into practice right here right now. Okay, maybe you don't have access to a real board, I'm not sure what your situation is, but if you can at least get, you know, a pen and a piece of paper out, calculate from the initial position, not try and move anything around, try and ask yourself the question and calculate whether or not white can take, bishop takes g6 in this position, come back to the video and I will tell you the solution. So the answer is yes, white can play bishop takes g6. However, one common thing that I've noticed among students when I've given them this position is that they'll only consider the move f takes g6 from black in this position, which would be a big mistake. White is indeed winning quite easily after these following moves, 
queen g6 check and then you take on d4 you're attacking the queen and you also have rook h4 sort of threats trying to just mate the black king over the most critical move in this position which you if you didn't even consider you definitely wouldn't have quote unquote solved the problem is that bishop takes f3 an in-between move and also one thing that you really need to notice actually from this initial position is that the material balance if you count it white is actually down a pawn a pawn was sacrificed earlier in the opening and this is very relevant after bishop takes g6 bishop takes f3 where if white plays g takes f3 of course you don't really want to play queen takes f3 because after this i mean white's just sort of down a piece but after g takes f3 some people you know they'll sort of be into the, you know the weeds of calculating these sort of lines and they might sort of be able to justify it but the big problem is in this position the black isn't really forced to play f takes g6 but rather they can play this in between move again queen g5 forcing a queen trade when white's attack sort of runs out of steam and since once again as i mentioned earlier white was down a pawn in the initial position if we just simplify all these pieces we are not going to be up a pawn in fact material is just going to be simply equal and to add insult to injury, we sort of have these doubled F pawns, which sort of, you know, wrecks our structure. Black horses pass D pawn, and that's something to take into account. But what you would have had to have seen from this initial position to really solve it is that after bishop takes G6, bishop takes F3, what we're not going to do is we're not going to capture on F3, but rather we're going to give a double check to black with bishop takes f7 also not only just a double check, but a double discovered check with the move bishop takes F7. And we're going to see how this works. So after takes, takes, bishop takes f7. The whole point is that now if black takes, we give e6 check. And basically the king has two real options. Well, I mean, technically free e8. But after e8, we can go like queen g6 check. And after king e7, queen g7, which is going to transpose to king e7 immediately since we play queen g7 here. And basically in all these positions, black is busted. We could go like e7 maybe. We have rook takes d4. Queen takes d4 also is quite strong. And like queen c6, queen takes c4, you can just see that we're going to be winning huge amount of material. Also, another key point to see is that if king f6, we get queen h4 check. And after king g7, e7, again, this dangerous fork, we're winning huge amounts of material now. Which basically means that this whole king takes f7 move after e6 is easily winning for white and uh, yeah black is just lost but even if you saw all that you still need to make sure you calculate one final detail which is in this position after bishop takes g6 bishop takes f3 bishop takes f7 what happens if black moves the king to the h file like to h8 and doesn't take on f7 and the key point to see here is that after simply takes 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 king h8 takes on f3 with the queen now that if black plays something like queen e7 to sort of add pressure to this bishop which we can't move of course due to the pin on the f file we can just simply back the bishop up with e6 black can reinforce the pressure there but after something like queen f4 takes e takes f7 and queen takes f7 we can either play queen takes h6 or queen takes d4 both options with of which both will give white a queen pawn advantage in the end game and also not to mention the fact that the black king is chronically weak so that definitely adds insult to injury but aside from that you know like the video subscribe if you're not already you know also check out my free newsletter in the description below for weekly-ish articles about chess improvement and also coaching if you are interested in that. But of course, with that being said, hope you guys all have a good day and I'll see you until next time.